So, you want to make retro sounding game music. Music that evokes the feel of the SNES, Nintendo 64, PlayStation 1, or Game Boy Advance without actually having to be compatible with any of those consoles. I get it, a lot of indie games these days use this kind of music to build a nostalgic connection, including my game, Breezy. In this tutorial, we're not going to be making a masterpiece or anything, but I'll show you the process of getting started with the software I use and writing a short song. Now, there's no requirements for this tutorial, but it does help if you've made music before, and I'm sure you already know this, but this isn't a hard and fast set of rules, it's just a guide. If you have any tips of your own, let me know in the comments. Before we crack open our computers, let's figure out an idea. It's important to know how you want your song to sound. If you're a game developer, this usually means knowing where the song will play in-game. In any case, though, it's a good idea to ask some questions about the song. For example, should it be short or long? Should it be dark and brooding or lighthearted? Simple or complex? Quiet and ambient or in your face? Keep in mind that these might change as you work on the song and figure out what sounds good. For the sake of demonstration, let's say I'm making a retro-style fighting game and I need a Street Fighter 2 inspired stage theme. The songs in that game are only about a minute long, so we'll want something short. We'll keep the mood pretty neutral with a somewhat fast-paced tempo. I think you can see where we're going here. Once you figure out your idea, you're ready to make the song. But how do we do that? The music making software I prefer is called OpenMPT. That name stands for Open Mod Plug Tracker. Open as in free and open source, so it's completely free to download and always will be. There's no pesky spyware or paywalled features, and if there is a feature you want, you could always ask for it, or even implement it yourself if you're a skilled programmer. As a tracker program, OpenMPT is a successor to software like Scream Tracker, which was used to make this iconic song. Since the heyday of trackers back in the 90s, they've gained more modern features like those you'd find in FL Studio or some other DAW, but the core remains the same, which is what allows for that great, semi-authentic retro sound. But, as I mentioned in my last tutorial, if you make a few songs and don't like it, don't hesitate to switch to something else. I'll quickly mention some of the other programs I've used. GarageBand is simpler to pick up, and your songs sound better produced automatically, but it's a lot harder to sound convincingly retro. LMMS is another open source program with a more traditional UI, but I found it has fewer features. Famatracker would be my choice for authentic NES music, but we're not covering chiptune in this video. So, if I've convinced you, go ahead and download the software. Once you've installed it and opened it up, go to File, New, Open MPT Module to make a new project. It should put you in the General tab, where you can set the song name and artist name. Next, we'll need some instruments, so switch to the Instruments panel. You can use VST instruments if you're familiar with those, but if we're really going retro, we need samples. Later on, I'll show you how to get the sound fonts for real Nintendo games, but for now we can just use the build and instruments. You'll find them in this sidebar under gm.dls. Let's start out with a simple drum beat. We'll need a kick, a snare, a hi-hat, and a crash cymbal. Clicking the plus next to gm.dls reveals some melodic banks and a drum kits folder. Expanding that gives us several different drum kits to try. I'll use the power drum kit. We can drag the whole drum kit into our instrument and let each different note represent a drum, but I prefer to drag each type of drum into its own separate instrument. For our kick, I'll drag in C3 bass drum 1. For the snare, I'll click this icon for a new instrument and drag in D3, acoustic snare. For our hi-hat, I'll use F sharp 3, closed hi-hat. And for the crash cymbal, how about C sharp 4, crash cymbal 1. If you'd like, you can try out different drums and even mix and match different drum kits, but I'll stick to these. Next, we'll need to set our tempo. Go back to the general tab where you'll see a slider and a button you can click on repeatedly to set the tempo. Once I figure out approximately what I want, I'll input a nice round number in case people want to play along with our song later on. If you want a swing tempo, click on the module info next to our song name and select Configure Swing to bring up this menu. We don't need any swing for our song though. Now we can finally make some noise. Head over to the Patterns tab and oh boy. It looks intimidating, but let's break down the screen. You'll notice a drop down here with those drums we chose. Make sure it has all of them. If it doesn't, you may have accidentally overwritten some previous instruments. Under that drop down, you'll see a bunch of white boxes. These are our patterns, which are just groups of notes. For music theorists, these are 16 bars long by default. We only have one pattern right now, but we'll make more soon. Under those patterns are probably what you'd notice first. A bunch of rows with dashes in them. If you press the play button, we start traversing down these boxes. You might have picked up that each one represents a note. After stopping the song, 
where you can traverse them using the arrow keys or the mouse. But these are a far cry from the piano roll you see in most programs. Let's investigate these dashes. Select the first instrument from the drop down menu and click on these far left dashes in the first row of our pattern. This is where we'll place our first note. If you have a MIDI keyboard, you should be able to press a note. If not, you may have to close and reopen the program or fiddle with some settings. Otherwise, you can press the A key on your computer keyboard to get a middle C. Now the note should read C501 V64 dash dash dash. Double clicking on it gives us some clues as to what all that means. C5, as you might have guessed, is the note we just pressed. It's not just notes that go here though. You can press the equals key to get a note off command, the back tick or tilde key to get a note cut, or the plus key to get a note fade. 01 represents the instrument that plays that note. V64 is a volume command that sets the note volume at the maximum. You might notice that it's grayed out. That's because V64 is the default volume command. If you navigate to the V64 command and type something else, it lights up. And if you delete that custom command, it grays out again. These last three dashes are where the power of OpenMPT shines. That's the space for an effect command. If we double click on the note again, we can see this drop down of all the effect types. Just look at the sheer quantity of them. Here's a fun one. S9F plays the sample backwards. If an effect ever doesn't make sense, or if you have any other questions, you can always check the OpenMPT manual to find out more about it. We don't need any effects right now though, so let's keep placing our drums. I'll start with a simple pattern of kick, snare, kick, snare. To be specific, I want one downbeat to be a kick, then the next downbeat to be a snare. I find it's easiest to place one instrument at a time, so let's start with the kicks. Since we have four notes per beat, I want to skip down eight rows at a time, so press A, down, 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 A, down, down, down. You get the idea. There's a faster way to do this though. If we put eight in this edit step box, we automatically skip down eight rows after placing a note. Now let's do the snare. Put one right here, then it's off to the races. I want to have a little fill at the end, so let's drag to select those last two beats, then hit delete. For our fill, let's just do two double snare hits in a row. Remember to set the edit step back at one for more precise control. Then I want some hi-hats over top, so let's select our hi-hat and set the edit step to 2 to get one hi-hat every 2 notes, or 2 per beat. Now we don't want to overwrite our kick and snare, so let's move over to channel 2 and spam that A key. That's one pattern down. You can duplicate a pattern by right-clicking and pressing, well, duplicate pattern. For the second pattern, let's add a crash symbol at the beginning and change the fill at the end. Alright, these drums are sounding good, so let's get some real instruments. Now, as you've heard, the drums we have now are pretty retro sounding already. If you want, you can just use the built-in samples, and if they sound good to you, that's all that matters. Sometimes though, you want to evoke nostalgia from a specific game, or just a specific console. Think about the Corneria theme from the original Star Fox on SNES. Those orchestra hits just represent that era for me. Luckily for us, some wonderful people have ripped the instrument samples from a whole bunch of classic games. If you're looking for Super Nintendo samples, William Cage has a collection of a lot of sound fonts for that console, including the Star Fox sound font ripped by I Teach Vader, who you might recognize. If you research online about using Nintendo sound fonts, you'll find an extensive debate over the legality of sampling these old classic games. Nintendo is known for being a very litigious company when it comes to using their copyrights without their permission. You may have heard about the Nintendo Ninjas shutting down fan games, but they seem to be fine with using their samples. Personally, I use something I like to call the Undertale rule. If Toby Fox did it, it's okay. Undertale uses a whole bunch of ripped samples from Earthbound, Mother 3, and other retro games, and it's not even subtle. But not only was the game not taken down, it got a Switch port and a Mii 
costume in Super Smash Bros. So if Toby Fox was allowed to get away with it, then so are you. So, let's download that sound font file and drag it into that left panel in OpenMPT, right under gm.dls. Now you can use it the same way. Feel free to build up a library of different sound fonts as you need them. Personally, I get a lot of mileage out of the Mother 3 sound font. And of course, there are other ways to get instruments besides ripping them from these classic games. The Mod Archive, a website for tracker program enthusiasts, offers two huge collections of instruments used heavily back in the 90s and early 2000s. These evoke the same retro feeling without calling back to any specific game. For our song though, we can just use the Star Fox sound font and our default drums. Now for the fun part, actually using these instruments. Since our song is about to get a lot more complex, let's go ahead and name our existing patterns. We can call Channel 1 Drums, Channel 2 Hi-Hat, and Channel 3 Crash. If you'd like to get a little more authentic, you can limit yourself to only a few channels, but that's a bit too overkill for me. Let's plot out a little melody to go on top of our drums. I'll use the organ instrument from our Star Fox sound font, just open up these folders and drag it in like we did with the drums. And like the drums, we can use the edit step controls and place our melody notes one at a time. If you want to hold a note, just press space to skip down a step. If you want to rest, remember that you can press the equals key to get a note off command. Plotting out your melody like this certainly feels different from just playing it in real time, but I find that it's a lot easier to do correctly once you get used to it. I don't have anything specific in mind melodically, so we'll just noodle around in C minor for a bit. If you don't have any experience composing, just fool around and see what sounds good. Alright, that should work. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's good enough for now. It could do with a little echo, though. And by echo, I don't mean any fancy schmancy VST effects. I mean selecting our melody, copying and pasting it into the next channel, sliding it down one note, and making it a little quieter. To make it quieter, we could manually add volume commands to each note, but that would take forever. Instead, just press Ctrl M with all the notes selected to open the Amplify menu. 40% should work for our echo. Oh, and while we're at it, you can decrease the volume for a whole instrument by finding it in the instrument menu and changing its global volume. I think our snare is a little too loud, so I'll bring it down to 36. Now let's add a bass line. I use the saw wave, again from Star Fox. We'll need the lower octaves, which is easy if you have a MIDI keyboard. For a computer keyboard, use the octave control at the top of the menu to get access to the lower notes. Just like the melody, we'll plot something quick and dirty. This isn't a composition lesson. Although, regarding composition, I do have one tip used by retro game composers especially. With limited channels and effects, it's harder to make your song sound full. You can do that by adding more instruments, but remember to keep the frequencies separate. You can even hear this in NES games where the three instrument channels will all be playing a few octaves apart. For our bass line, this means we need to keep it low and quiet enough that our melody is still on top. It can be complex, just not overpowering. The art of mixing extends to all areas of music though, and it's a can of worms for another time, and hopefully another person. With the bass line done, let's add a B section to our song to break up the monotony. Select our two patterns, shift click to get both of them, and press Ctrl D, or right click and press duplicate patterns again. If you want, you can even add a separator between them, or give them different names. Once you've done that though, make sure you're in the 2 pattern, then delete the existing melody and bass line. Let's also add a crash symbol at the start. I want to switch up our main instrument for this part, so I'll add in that orchestra hit I mentioned earlier. Once again, tap out a little melody. I'll add some echo to this one too, but I'll drag it down two notes instead of one to give it a little extra gravitas. I'll also use a simpler bass line to draw attention to the melody. To up the tension even further, let's add some chords that fade in during the B section. We can use the strings instrument with a large edit step to keep the notes long and drawn out. To fade notes in, bring up that Ctrl M Amplify menu again and select Fade In From. We'll do a linear fade in from zero. The strings also sound a little loud in the mix, so we'll turn our global volume down to 40. this is starting to sound pretty nice. Let's just make some final adjustments. If we listen to our song and let it loop over, the strings hold that last note throughout the A section, which gets pretty annoying. Let's add some note cut commands to the first row of the A section to fix that. Remember, that's the backtick key. I also think it'd be neat to add a little reverse symbol coming into the B section. Remember that S9F command I mentioned to reverse a sample? Let's apply that to a crash symbol note and fade it in from zero. Something else that's a little annoying, our song is mixed in mono right now. A lot of retro games use stereo sound, so let's add 
some fancy stereo effects. To pan one instrument left or right, just find it in the instrument menu, check set panning, and add a custom pan value from 0 to 128. It might help to click on some channels to mute them, or right click a channel and press solo all to hear an instrument in isolation. If you want to pan a note separately, you can use the PXX volume command, or the XXX effect command to set the panning. I'll separate the strings during the B section so that one note plays more in the left ear and the other plays more in the right. There is something to watch out for with panning though. The more you pan an instrument in one direction, the quieter it sounds, so you may have to adjust the mix to account for this. For example, I had the global volume for the string set to 40, but I decided to up it to 50 to compensate for the stereo separation. Throughout this process, the most important step is to listen to the song plenty of times, even when you're not actually making it. My most listened artist on Last FM is myself. Also, just like you use source control for games, use it for songs as well, or at least make regular backups. OpenMPT's undo feature can be flaky sometimes, or you might decide you like a previous version of the song better. Once you finalize the song though, go to File, Stream Export to turn it into something you can use in-game. I suggest FLAC audio, since it's the same quality as a WAV file with a much smaller file size. So, that's our full song. Mine is pretty short and simple, and yours probably is too. That's just a natural consequence of using a new software. It's definitely possible to make complex songs that still sound retro. You can check out the Plock soundtrack for evidence of that, or just go to Help, Example Modules, and Open MPT. The songs I made lately are fairly complex, but there's still plenty I haven't learned about the software and about composing music in general. So, if you already make retro style music, give us some tips in the comments. Or just let me know if you decide to try out this tutorial. Until next time though, have a good day.